Chapter 17 of Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Steve Cullen, Ottawa, Canada. My first visit to Chusan in 1843 was during the autumn and winter. But in 1844, I had an opportunity of exploring this beautiful island at intervals from the commencement of spring until the close of the season. At this time, the first impression regarding the unhealthiness of the climate had been entirely removed, and the island was looked upon as the most healthy in the Chinese seas. It will be recollected that when the island was first occupied by our troops, the mortality was so great that the place was pronounced by everyone to be the most unhealthy in China. Many a brave soldier fell a victim to the malignant fever which prevailed at the time. No regiment suffered more than Her Majesty's 26th, the Cameronians, who were encamped on a green hill which overlooked the city, and which certainly appeared to be the most healthy spot which could have been selected for the purpose. That place still bears the name of the Cameronian Hill, and is now thickly strewed with the graves of our countrymen. It soon became evident that this great mortality proceeded from other causes than the paddy fields which surrounded the city of Tinghai. Invalids from Hong Kong and Amoy were sent here to recover their health, and the difference in the appearance of the troops stationed in Chusan from those in Hong Kong was most marked. Dr. Maxwell of the Madras Army, who was a most excellent judge in such matters, has often expressed his opinion that, with good medical skill and ordinary care, this beautiful island might have been rendered one of the most healthy stations for our troops in the east. Indeed, everyone now seemed to regret that we had not secured Chusan as a part of the British dominions for the protection of our trade in China, instead of the barren and unhealthy island of Hong Kong. And some even went so far as to recommend that means should still be taken by our government to accomplish this desirable end. The time, however, for doing this had gone by, and I believe that every right-thinking person would have seen with regret any power exercised by a great and exalted nation like England to infringe a solemn treaty which had been entered into with a nation so utterly powerless as the Chinese. And most assuredly nothing less than this, no negotiations or promises, would have induced the Chinese to give up an island like Chusan, which commands the central and most important parts of their empire. That we committed a blunder and made a bad bargain is quite certain, but having done so, we must abide by the consequences. Had we retained Chusan, it would not only have been a healthy place for our troops and merchants, but it would also have proved a safeguard to our trade in the north, which must ultimately become of greater importance than that of Canton. Moreover, we should have been in a central position as regards a large and important part of the world, which must sooner or later open its ports to our commerce. I allude, of course, to Japan and Korea, both of which are only a few days' sail from Chusan, and are still in a great measure sealed countries to the Europeans. These regrets, however, are vain. Chusan in spring is one of the most beautiful islands in the world. It reminds the Englishman of his own native land. In the mornings the grass sparkles with dew, the air is cool and refreshing, the birds are singing in every bush, and flowers are hanging in graceful festoons from the trees and hedges. The new plants of the island, some of which I had discovered in the preceding autumn, I now saw in flower for the first time. Early in spring, the hillsides were covered with the beautiful Daphne with lilac flowers, Daphne fortuni lindel, Azalea ovata lindel, certainly one of the finest and most distinct plants of this kind which I have introduced, also grows wild in the hills and was in full bloom at this period. A fine new Budlia, B. lindliana, had a most graceful appearance as its long spikes of purple flowers hung in profusion from the hedges on the hillsides, often side by side with the well-known Glycin sinensis. Another plant, certainly one of the most beautiful shrubs of northern China, the Waigila rosea, was first discovered in the garden of a Chinese mandarin near the city of Tinghai in this island. This spring it was loaded with its noble rose-colored flowers and was the admiration of all who saw it, both English and Chinese, I have great pleasure in saying that all these plants and many others, natives of Chusan, are now growing in our gardens in England. Ningpo is about 40 miles west from Chusan, and is situated on the mainland. My visits to it at different times during this summer were attended with much less difficulty than in the preceding autumn. I was now beginning to speak a little Chinese, and was perfectly acquainted with the town 
and the whole of the places where the different mandarins' gardens and nurseries were situated. The mandarins were particularly inquisitive at this time about everything which belonged to the movements of the English, or other foreigners, who were likely to establish themselves at their port, and I soon perceived that, as we were able to keep up a conversation together in Chinese, my visits were very agreeable to them. The nurserymen, too, having found out that my money was as valuable to them as that which they received from their own countrymen, and were all anxiety to sell me any plants I wanted. The gardens of the mandarins were extremely gay, particularly during the early months of the year, and, what was of more importance to me, contained a number of new plants of great beauty and interest. On entering one of the gardens in a fine morning in May, I was struck with a mass of yellow flowers which completely covered a distant part of the wall. The color was not a common yellow, but had something of buff in it, which gave the flowers a striking and uncommon appearance. I immediately ran up to the place and to my surprise and delight found that it was a most beautiful new double yellow climbing rose. I have no doubt, from what I afterwards learned, that this rose is from the more northern districts of the empire, and will prove perfectly hardy in Europe. Another rose, which the Chinese call the five-coloured, was also found in one of these gardens at this time. It belongs to the section commonly called China roses in this country, but grows in a very strange and beautiful manner. Sometimes it produces self-coloured blooms, being either red or French white, and frequently having flowers of both on the one plant at the same time while at other times the flowers are striped with the two colors. This will also be as hardy as our common china rose. Gleason sinensis is often grown on a flat trellis in front of the summer house, or forms a kind of portico which affords a pleasing shade. Entwined with one of these trees I found another variety, having very long racemes of pure white flowers, which contrasted well with the light blue of the other. I obtained permission from the old Chinese gentleman to whom it belonged, my old friend Dr. Chang, to make some layers of this fine plant, and I am happy to say that one of these is now alive in the garden at Chiswick. The Horticultural Society, having sent me out some small optical instruments to be given as presents, I presented some of them to the doctor, with which he was much pleased, and offered in return to let me have whatever cuttings or plants from his garden I might wish to possess. We are generally led to believe that ladies of rank in this country are never seen by visitors, it is quite true that Chinese custom in this respect differs entirely from ours, and that the females here, like those of most half-civilized or barbarous nations, are kept in the background, and are not considered to be on an equality with their husbands. For example, they do not sit at the same table. When a sing-song or theatrical performance is got up, they are put on a place out of view, where they can see all that is going on, and yet remain unseen. But for all this they are not entirely secluded from society. At least they use frequently to honour me with their presence, and crowd round me with the greatest curiosity. At first they used to be extremely shy, and only took sly peeps at me from behind doors and through windows. By and by, however, their strong curiosity conquered their bashfulness, and then they used to stand and look on very composedly. They generally, however, kept at a little distance and whenever a movement was made towards where they stood, they pretended to be vastly frightened and ran away, but they soon came back again. To Mr. Mackenzie, one of our merchants at Ningpo, and also to Mr. Tom, Her Majesty's Consul, I was greatly indebted for their kindness and hospitality. They did everything in their power to forward my views, and to both these gentlemen I take this opportunity of rendering my best thanks. After having spent the summer in the districts of Ningpo, Chusan, and Shanghai, I returned to the last-mentioned place, where my plans were all collected, intending immediately to sail for Hong Kong, and send a portion of them home to England. But the exposure to the sun during the summer was now beginning to affect my health, and when I landed at Shanghai, I was laid up with a severe attack of fever. Providentially, this happened when I was amongst my English friends, and, as I had the means of procuring excellent medical advice, I recovered in the course of a fortnight, and was able to proceed to sea, where the change of air completed my cure. I reached Hong Kong in November, and forthwith made preparations for sending my collections home in several vessels, which were at anchor in the bay at this time. During the summer which had now passed by, I had had frequent opportunities of inspecting the tombs of the Chinese, both in the northern and southern districts. In the south, the natives form no regular cemeteries or churchyards, as we do in Europe, but the tombs of the dead are scattered all over the sides of the hills, the most pleasant situations being generally selected. 
the more wealthy individuals often convey their dead a considerable distance and employ a kind of fortune teller whose duty it is to find out the most appropriate resting place this man goes with the corpse to the place appointed and of course pretends to be very wise in the selection of the spot as well as in the choice of the soil with which the ashes of the dead are to mingle in after years and upon trial should the particular earth appear unsuitable he immediately orders the procession off to some other place in the neighborhood where he expects to be more successful i believe many of the chinese have this important point settled before they die for one day when one of our principal merchants went to call on old haukwa the late hong merchant at canton a tray was brought into the room with several kinds of earth upon it which the old man examined with great care and then fixed on the one in which he wished to be buried a situation on the hillside is also considered of great importance especially if it commands a view of a beautiful bay or lake but i believe that of all places the one most coveted is where a winding stream in its course passes and then returns again to the foot of the hill where the grave is to be made the director of the ceremonies with a compass in his hand settles the direction in which the body is to lie which is another point of great interest an intelligent chinese with whom i was acquainted informed me that this fortune teller of the dead is often very eloquent in his descriptions of the future happiness of those who obey his directions he informs them that they or their children or someone in whom they are much interested shall enjoy riches and honours in after life as a reward for the attention and respect they have paid to the remains of their fathers that as the stream which they then behold when standing around their father's grave flows and returns again in its windings so shall their path through life be smooth and pleasant until they sink into the tomb hoary with years respected beloved and mourned by their children these men are generally great rogues and play upon the prejudices of the people it frequently happens that after a corpse has been interred for some time they call upon their relatives and inform them that for some cause which they affect to explain it is absolutely necessary to remove and reinter it should the relations object to this the answer is very well i don't care but your children and relations will also be regardless of your remains when you die and you will be miserable in your graves the feelings of the poor deluded people are thus wrought upon and a further sum of money is extracted for finding a more suitable grave the late mr lay during one of his rambles amongst the hills and the banks of the river min was present at one of these ceremonies and the relatives of the deceased crowded round him and consulted him as to the site of the grave under the impression that he was well versed in such matters he remarks in his journal that much good or much evil is thought to betide the survivors from a right or wrong position kyangsu practitioners in this tele or feng shui or soothsaying from the influence of the earth's local modalities get large monies by the trade but as they do not agree amongst themselves the people are fain to ask counsel of a stranger in my travels in the south of china i often came upon graves in the most retired places amongst the hills they were all more or less of the same form namely a half circle cut out of the hillside having the body interred behind it sometimes indeed generally there were several of these half circles with a succession of terraces in front of the grave and in the burying places of the more wealthy the semicircles were built of brick or stone and on a more extensive scale in the centre of the semicircle and of course near the body the gravestone is placed with this inscription m callery an excellent chinese scholar informed me that these inscriptions are always of the most simple kind merely stating the name of the deceased that he died in such a dynasty in such a year this is the plain and unflattering tale which the chinese tombstone tells in some instances i cannot tell if in all after the body has decayed the bones are dug up and carefully put into earthenware vessels which are then placed on the hillside above ground these as well as the graves are visited at stated times by the relatives they go first to the grave of the patriarch or father of the tribe and then to those of the other members of the family in rotation where they perform their devotions and offer incense they afterwards dine together when the ceremonies are over i was once or twice in the wild mountain districts in the interior at the time when the natives visited the tombs even the most retired parts had their visitors and it was both pleasing and affecting to see the little groups assembled round the graves paying the tribute of affection to those whose memory they revered and loved the widow was seen kneeling by the grave of her lost husband children often very young shedding tears of sorrow for a father or mother and sometimes an old man whose hair was white with age was there mourning the loss of those whom he had looked to as the support of his declining years 
all were cutting the long grass and weeds which were growing round the tubes and planting their favorite flowers to bloom and to decorate them near amoy this scattered mode of interring the dead has been departed from and perhaps necessarily in consequence of the large population in the country however i sometimes find tombs in retired and inaccessible parts of the hills here as well as in more southern provinces but these are evidently the property of the wealthy inhabitants as the traveller proceeds northward the circular form of the tombs is less common and they become more varied in their appearance in chusan ningpo and various other places in that district a great number of the coffins are placed on the surface of the ground and merely thatched over with straw i met with these coffins in all sorts of places on the sides of the public highway on the banks of the rivers and canals and in woods and other retired parts of the country sometimes the thatch was completely off the wood rotten and the remains of the chinamen of former days exposed to view on one hillside on the island of chusan skulls and bones were lying about in all directions and more than once when wandering through the long brushwood in this place i have been entangled by getting my feet through the lid of a coffin i believe that the wealthy in these districts generally bury their dead and some of them build very chaste and beautiful tombs there are three or four very fine ones in the island of chusan where the paving in front of the mound which contains the body is beautiful and the carving elaborate the whole of the stonework is square instead of circular as in the tombs in the south of china here as at home and i believe in every part of the world trees of the pine tribe are generally planted in the burying grounds lord jocelyn in his campaign in china mentioned such places in the following beautiful and appropriate language here and there as if dropped at random among the sides of the hills were clumps of pine trees and peeping through their thick foliage the roofs of houses and temples diversified the scene amongst many of the beautiful groves of trees which here invite the wanderer to repose spots are selected as the resting place of mortality and gazing on these tranquil scenes where the sweet clematis and fragrant flowers help to decorate the last home of man the most careless eye cannot fail to mark the beauties of the grave in the shanghai district i have frequently visited large houses which seem to have been built by the rich expressly as mausoleums in these houses i generally found a coffin in one of the principal rooms and an altar with all the trappings of idolatry where incense on the high days is burned to the memory of the deceased and various other ceremonies are gone through by the relatives these houses or temples are generally surrounded by a pine wood and sometimes the body is carried out of the doors the altar and records only being kept in the temple where a servant with his family is always placed to look after them when the english first established themselves at shanghai some of them had thoughts of taking houses in the country that their families might enjoy retirement and fresh air one day towards the end of eighteen forty three i accompanied a gentleman of my acquaintance on an errand of this kind when we had proceeded about six or eight miles from shanghai we observed a good-looking house on a wood hard by and determined to pay it a visit and see whether the occupant would be inclined to let it as we drew near all was set and quiet not even our old enemies the dogs appeared to dispute our approach when the chinese who always followed us in considerable numbers wherever we went saw us approaching the house they stood still at a little distance watching our proceedings with a great degree of interest we knocked at the door of the mansion and then stood at one side so that the porter might not see that his visitors were the hong mo jins or red-haired race as they are pleased to call the english for we well knew that if we were seen the door would not be opened in a few seconds we heard the sounds of feet and then a voice summoned us to know our business we mumbled something in chinese and the poor man quite unconscious of his danger threw open the door i shall never forget the look of mingled fear and astonishment which he gave us as we quietly walked into the court at the same time the group of natives outside were indulging in hearty laughter at the way in which he had been entrapped the courtyard where we now were was neatly paved and the whole of the house appeared to be in excellent repair as we were led from room to room by our terrified guide everything appeared quite suitable for a country residence at least as good as one could expect in such an out-of-the-way place and my friend remarked that it was the best he had yet seen and he should certainly make an effort to get possession of it at last we came to what appeared the principal room ah this shall be my drawing-room said my companion but what is that added he in the same breath i looked in the direction in which he pointed and a large massive coffin met my eye we then discovered that we were in one of those places set apart for the remains of the dead during one of my journeys in the interior 
I met with a very curious tomb near the town of Songkyang Fu. It was placed on the side of a hill, in a wood, and evidently belonged to some very wealthy or important personage of that city. From the base of the hill to where the tomb stood about halfway up, the visitor ascended by a broad flight of steps, on each side of which were placed a number of figures carved in stone. As far as I can recollect, the following was the order in which the figures were placed. First, a pair of goats or sheep, one on each side. Second, two dogs. Third, two cats. Fourth, two horses saddled and bridled. And fifth, two most gigantic priests, the effect of the whole being most strange and imposing. There is another tomb of the same description near Ningpo, but on a much smaller scale. The flowers which the Chinese plant on or among the tombs are simple and beautiful in their kind. No expensive camellias, mutans, or other finer ornaments of the garden are chosen for this purpose. Sometimes the conical mound of earth, when the grave is of this kind, is crowned with a large plant of fine, tall, waving grass. At Ningpo wild roses are planted, which soon spread themselves over the grave, and when their flowers expand in spring, cover it with a sheet of pure white. At Shanghai, a pretty bulbous plant, a species of lycoris, covers the graves in autumn with masses of brilliant purple. When I first discovered the anemone japonica, it was in full flower amongst the graves of the natives, which are round the ramparts of Shanghai. It blooms in November, when other flowers have gone by, and is a most appropriate ornament to the last resting places of the dead. The poor, as well as the rich, often keep their dead in their dwelling houses for a long time. I should imagine, from the numerous coffins which I met with in such circumstances, that many are thus kept for years. The coffins are remarkably thick and strong, and the joints so carefully cemented that no unpleasant smell is emitted during the decay of the body. Much of the respect which is paid by the Chinese to the memory of the deceased relatives may doubtless be a mere matter of form, sanctioned and rendered necessary by the custom of ages, but I am inclined to think that a considerable portion springs from a higher and purer source, and I have no doubt that when the Chinese periodically visit the tombs of their fathers to worship and pay respect to their memory, they indulge in the pleasing reflection that when they themselves are no more, their graves will not be neglected or forgotten, but will also be visited by their children and grandchildren, in whose hearts and affections they will live for many, many years after their bodies have mouldered into dust. End of chapter 17 this recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 of Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Steve Cullen, Ottawa, Canada. The collections of plants and seeds which I had made during the summer and autumn of 1844 arrived in safety at Hong Kong, and I lost no time in shipping them for England. All the living objects were planted as usual in wards cases, well guarded with iron bars and placed upon the poops of the largest vessels I could find then at anchor in the bay. I always took care to divide my collections into three or four parts for the purpose of sending them by different ships, so if that anything happened to one portion, the others had a chance of reaching England in safety. The last shipment at this time was made on the 31st of December. As it was then winter in the northern provinces, and as nothing could be done in the south, I determined to go over to the Philippine Islands for a few weeks, and accordingly sail for Manila in the beginning of January 1845. The voyage from Hong Kong to Manila at this season is generally made in six or eight days, as the monsoon is fair. I need not give any description of the town, which is well known as being the chief Spanish settlement in the Philippines. The inhabitants are principally Spaniards, Indians, Chinese, and there are a few English mercantile establishments. The chief productions and exports are sugar, coffee, rice, cheroots, and indigo. The beautiful cloth generally known by the name of piña, which is made from the fiber of the pineapple plant, is manufactured and embroidered by the natives and is sold in the shops. A kind of hemp, the product of a species of musa, is also made into ropes and cables. It is highly prized and in much demand amongst the shipping in the East. The cigar manufactory, a government monopoly, is one of the largest establishments in the town. Almost the whole of the labor in it is performed by women and girls. When I landed, it happened to be the hour when the workpeople were coming out of the factory and the streets were crowded with females. 
as I was not aware of the circumstances, I began to think that the women must form the chief part of the population. As I had no object in remaining in the town, I applied to the authorities for a passport to enable me to proceed at once into the interior of the island. The traveller, if he is not well acquainted with the customs of the place, is exposed to much annoyance from the Spanish regulations regarding passports. Some new regulations had been established just before my arrival, and I found that I could not land without either having a passport or getting some well-known merchant to become surety for my conduct. Having landed, a second passport was necessary to enable me to remain on the island, another before I could go into the interior, and a fourth when I wished to leave the country. These passports had to be signed by different individuals, and at different offices, and if the slightest informality occurred, the party was turned back or the vessel detained. I was much indebted to Messrs. Butler and Messrs. Holiday Wise and Company, English merchants at Manila, who rendered me every assistance in their power. Having at length got over these difficulties, and engaged some guides and servants, our baggage was put into a banca, or boat, and we started for the Laguna, a large lake in the interior and the source of the river in which the town of Manila stands. We had to cross the lake, and we were strongly advised to do so at night, as it is generally smooth at this time. We soon perceived the value of this advice. The bancas are built long and narrow for swiftness, as they have often to make way against a rapid current which flows down the river. Outriggers are fixed to the sides of the boats to enable the Indians to run out and balance them when the wind comes down in strong puffs, and when without these they would be often thrown on their beam ends and capsized. When I awoke in the morning we were halfway across the lake, and a day was just dawning. Those who have never been in eastern tropical countries can form no idea of the beauty and freshness of early morning in the Philippines. The broad sheet of water through which we were swiftly passing was smooth as glass, and shone like a mirror. There was not a breath of air to disturb it. The shores of the lake were rich in vegetation, and trees and bushes dipping their luxuriant branches into the water, and crowning the summit of every hill. In this beautiful region, winter is unknown, for here the trees ever blossom, the beams ever shine. As soon as the sun began to appear above the horizon, the whole surface of the lake was put in motion by the breeze which then began to blow, and which gradually increased until it became a pretty strong gale. Our sail was close reefed, and all the crew except the man at the helm stood on the outriggers to balance the boat, walking out or in as the wind was more or less powerful. In less than half an hour, the lake was covered with waves rolling like those of the sea. Every now and then we took one on board, and were soon, as well as our beds and baggage, completely drenched with water. Luckily, we were near our destination on the opposite shore, where we soon arrived in safety. I counsel all travellers to beware of crossing the laguna by day and I took good care to avoid doing so on my return. Having landed, I made the best of my way to the farm of Don Enega González de Azaula, whom I had met in Manila and who had kindly offered me the use of his house in the interior. My chief object in visiting this part of the country was to procure, if possible, a supply of the beautiful orchid, Phalaenopsis amabilis, which Cumming had sent home a few years before, but which was still extremely rare in England. His Grace, the Duke of Devonshire, purchased the first plant, for which he gave the large sum of one hundred guineas. As I had very little time to spare, I was anxious to make the most of my opportunities. I made an Indian's hut in the wood, my headquarters, where I held a sort of market for the purchase of orchids. The Indians knew the hour at which I should return to the hut, and on my arrival I generally found the ground in front strewed with orchids in the state which they had been cut from the trees, and many of them covered with flowers. The Phalaenopsis, in particular, was singularly beautiful. I was very anxious to get some large specimens of the plant, and offered a dollar, which was a high sum in an Indian forest, for the largest which should be brought to me. The lover of this beautiful tribe will easily imagine the delight I felt when one day I saw two Indians approaching with a plant of extraordinary size, having ten or twelve branching flower stalks upon it, and upwards of a hundred flowers in full bloom. There, said they in triumph, is not that worth a dollar? I acknowledged that they were well entitled to the reward, and took immediate possession of my prize. This plant is now in the garden of the Horticultural Society of London, and although it was a little reduced, in order to get it into the plant case at Manila, is still by far the largest specimen in Europe. This beautiful species may be well called the Queen of Orchids. The air plants are not found so frequently in the dense shaded parts of the forests as in the edges of the woods, on trees by the roadsides, and in exposed situations. 
I found the genus Aridis very often in the most dense parts of the woods, but never a single plant of Phalaenopsis. The latter was commonly found growing on the branches of the mango in the cleared parts of the woods, near the cottages of the Indians, and sometimes on the very tops of the high trees, where it was fully exposed to the sun. I confess this fact was quite contrary to the opinion I had formed of the habits of these plants, for I expected to have found them principally in the damp shaded forests, where the sun's rays could seldom penetrate, but such is not the case, at least in the Philippine Islands. Having ransacked the country around Don and Eagle's farm, I now set off, accompanied by my servants and some other Indians, to St. Pablo and Dolores. Dolores is a small village on a wild part of the country, where the natives bear a very bad character, having frequently attacked and robbed travellers. During our progress, my companions related a great many stories of this kind, and were evidently not a little frightened. The roads were only narrow lanes, leading through dense thickets of brushwood, and the locality was certainly an excellent one for lawless characters of every description to do exactly as they pleased in. On one occasion when I had gone a little way ahead of the party, something alarmed them, and the whole set took to their heels and ran off in another direction. I rode back after the fugitives, and being well armed explored the ground in every direction to find out the cause of their alarm, but could discover nothing, and at length I persuaded them to return and pursue the journey. Shortly after this, however, a wild-looking Indian stepped out of the forest and stood eyeing us narrowly as we passed him on the road. He had a short matchlock in his hand, and evidently belonged to the band of freebooters who infested this part of the country. I passed him in a very slow and deliberate manner, taking care to watch his motions and to let him see that I and some of my party were well armed and prepared for any attack. After looking at us in silence for a minute or two, he jumped into the jungle and disappeared. As our path winded through the jungle, we sometimes could only see a very short distance either before or behind us. At one of these bends, we heard a noise amongst the bushes, as if a number of men were advancing rapidly towards us, and naturally concluded that we were about to be attacked. A halt was instantly called, and then the question was whether we should advance or recede. As I had no time to lose, I looked to my firearms and determined to proceed. Accordingly, I rode forward a few paces to reconnoitre, and saw a numerous band, not of robbers or freebooters, but I hope my courteous reader will not laugh, of monkeys. There must have been several hundreds of these animals in the trees, jumping about from branch to branch, and evidently enjoying themselves vastly. As we passed amongst them, they commenced chattering and making all sorts of faces at us. At length we reached the little village of Dolores, and as in duty bound, I immediately went to pay my respects to the padre. His house was a small, miserable hut, little better than those of the Indians which surrounded it, and poorly furnished. He received us kindly, and told us that we were welcome to the shelter his houses afforded, and although he had little to offer us in the way of luxuries, he should do everything in his power to make us comfortable. At the same time he informed us we were in a dangerous neighborhood, and that he could not answer for the security of the ponies or baggage. The servants and Indians who accompanied me were accommodated in another house which was building for the padre, and the ponies were tied up there, and a watch set over them. The Indians mounted guard by turns, and they were well armed, and as they were much frightened there was no danger of their neglecting their duty. I was told in the morning that they had been roused several times during the night, but I fancy imagination had something to do with it, as I found that everything belonging to us was perfectly safe. In the evening, after dark, the worthy Padre did everything in his power to amuse me. He had an old pianoforte, which had found its way by some means into this wild mountain district but I presume had never been tuned since its first arrival, for it was sadly out of order. On this he played a number of Spanish and Italian airs, accompanying the instrument with his voice. After exhausting his own stock of songs, he sent for his servant boy and the headman of the village, who were musicians, and got up a sort of concert. The padre played on the pianoforte, the boy on the fife, and the other on the clarionet. It must be confessed, however, that the music was not very harmonious. The greater part of the following day was spent in exploring the surrounding country, and in the afternoon I bade the hospitable priest adieu, and started for St. Pablo, which was situated in a more civilized part of the country. There also, and indeed wherever I went, the priests were most kind and hospitable. The Philippine Islands must, at one time, have been a complete nest of volcanoes. With one exception, they are all now inactive but traces of them were met with at every step of our progress through the higher districts of the country, in the form of circular pools of stagnant water and masses of lava, which still emit a most disagreeable odor when they were stirred up. On the top of a high hill near St. Pablo, 
I came unexpectedly on the remains of a still more recent volcano. The trees in its vicinity were in a most unhealthy state, many of their roots and branches being decayed. Sometimes I sunk nearly up to the knees against the burnt-looking earth, which emitted a strong sulfurous smell, and as none of the natives were with me, I was sometimes afraid of getting into the mouth of the crater and going down altogether. The island of Luzon, of which Manila is the capital, is very like Java and other parts of the Straits. It is very hilly, but extremely fertile, and affords a most striking contrast to the barren shores of the south of China which I had just left. Large crops of rice are produced on the lowlands which are capable of being flooded. Sugar and tobacco are grown on such ground, as would produce good wheat in England, and coffee and chocolate trees were planted on the sides of the hills. The Manila mango is considered one of the finest in the world, not inferior to that which produced near Bombay. Coconuts, plantains, bananas, and other tropical fruits abound, and are to be had in great perfection. Besides these, oranges are also cultivated, but they are inferior to those of China and Europe. Indeed, as might be expected, all the fruits, natives of more northern latitudes, which we find in these islands, are more surpassed by the same kinds which grow in climates more congenial to their nature. The vine is largely cultivated, but it produces grapes of a very inferior quality. The mountainous portions of the country are for the most part on a state of nature, being covered with trees and with brushwood, which in some places so thick that I had to employ the Indians to cut away through it with small bill hooks which they kept for the purpose. In other parts, the tops of the tall trees form a mass so dense that no ray ever shines through them. The ground on the sides of the mountains is always in a moist and slimy condition, and the habitation of millions of leeches. In my first excursion to the mountains, I observed the feet and legs of the Indians, who were cutting a path for me, covered with blood, and at first I fancied that they must have wounded themselves with the thorny shrubs which they were cutting. On inquiry, however, I found that it was the leeches that were doing the mischief, and in a very little time I had a good many specimens of their powers upon my own skin. There were two species, one a small linear one, and the other nearly round. Whenever the former fixed upon the Indians, they invariably pulled it off, but they never interfered with the little round one. I found that the reason for this was that the latter, if taken off by force, would leave a very painful wound, but that if allowed to suck until it was full, it would drop off of its own accord and leave scarcely a mark. The other species might be taken off with impunity. At first, when they fixed themselves upon me, which they did through my stockings, I set to work to pull them off without regard to the species, although warned by the natives of the impropriety of doing so. In a short time my legs were covered with blood, and the wounds annoyed me with a kind of itching soreness for several days afterwards. With the exception of the orchids, the Philippines are not very rich in plants of an ornamental kind. As far as I had an opportunity of judging, the vegetation of Luzon bears a great resemblance to the island of Java and the other parts of the Malay archipelago. The country is, however, very rich in birds and shells, and many of the land species of the latter are extremely valuable. Mr. Cunning, who is well known in this part of the world, made very large collections of them, and has already distributed them over the greater part of Europe and America. After spending about three weeks in the interior of Luzon, and having procured a fine supply of the beautiful Phalaenopsis and several other orchids, I returned to the town of Manila, and shipped a portion of them to England. These, I am happy to say, arrived in excellent order, and upon reference to the garden lists on my return, I find that no fewer than forty-five specimens of this lovely plant, the Queen of Orchids, has been distributed amongst the fellows of the Horticultural Society of London. The time which I had allotted for this excursion having expired, I sailed from my old station in the north of China and arrived there on the 14th of March, 1845. On going up the coast, we had to contend with the northeast monsoon and to beat windward during the whole of the passage. One afternoon when it was nearly dark and when the sea was running very high, one of the men who was out on the bowsprit lost his hold and owing to the heaving of the vessel and fell into the sea. The cry of a man overboard! That particular cry amongst sailors which, once heard, can never be forgotten, made me rush on deck. The schooner was going at a rate of at least eight knots, but her helm was instantly put down and her way stopped. A hand was sent aloft to keep his eye upon the poor fellow whose head was seen every now and then as he rose upon a wave, and in a few seconds the schooner was close at his side. A rope was thrown out to him, and everyone thought that he would be able to lay hold and be drawn in over the side. Probably from exhaustion, he unfortunately missed it, and the schooner shooting ahead at the time, 
he was again left to the mercy of the waves. As a last resource, the boat was lowered, and although rather a dangerous service, several gallant fellows stepped into it and pulled in the direction signaled to them from the ship. Those on board were in a state of the most painful suspense. When we caught a glimpse of the man from time to time, he was evidently sinking, and in a few more seconds, all must have been over with him. The boat was nearly lost to us in the closing darkness, and the men told us that they were on the point of returning to the ship without getting a glimpse of their poor messmate when they saw his head rise above a wave close by, and pulling towards him, they caught him by the hair and drew him into the boat. When brought on board, he was in a most exhausted state, but the usual remedies being applied, he recovered in the course of the night. End of chapter 18. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 of Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Steve Cullen, Ottawa, Canada. It was the commencement of spring when I returned to the north of China. In this season of the year, no country can be more agreeable or healthy than this. The air is bracing, the sky generally clear, and the mornings are delightfully cool. Before long, vegetation progressed with wonderful rapidity, far surpassing anything of the kind I had ever witnessed in England. By the middle of April, deciduous trees and shrubs were covered with leaves. Barley was in full ear, and the oil plant, Brassica sinensis, was seen forming masses of golden yellow on the hillsides and on the plains, where the air was perfumed with the fragrance of its blossoms. My object during this summer was to make a complete collection of all my finest plants for the purpose of taking them home under my own care. I lost no time, therefore, in visiting all my former acquaintances, mandarins, and nurserymen, and made my selections when the plants were in bloom. Tree peonies, azaleas, viburnums, daphnes, roses, and many other plants, all new to Europe and of great beauty, were from time to time added to this collection. As many of these plants could be only verified by the color of their flowers, it was absolutely necessary that I should visit the different districts three or four times during the spring, and consequently that I should lose as little time as possible in traveling from one place to another. Shanghai, Chusan, Ningpo, and many other parts of the interior, all lying wide of each other, had some object of interest which demanded my presence and attention. The distance from Ningpo to Shanghai is about a hundred miles. I had completed my researches in the Ningpo district and was very anxious to get to Shanghai as soon as possible in order to see some azaleas in bloom, which I was anxious to add to my collections. In another fortnight their flowers would have been all faded and it would then have been impossible to identify the different varieties. There were two routes from Ningpo to Shanghai, one for the foreigners and the other for the natives. The legal road was to go across to Chusen, then garrisoned by the English, a distance of thirty or forty miles, nearly due east, and then take the chance of finding some vessel about to sail for Wusong or Shanghai. I knew that if I took this line, in all probability I should have to wait for eight or ten days in Chusen, before such an opportunity would occur a delay which would have entirely defeated the object which I had in view. I determined, therefore, to go by the interdicted route and take my chances of consequences. The journey overland was a very interesting one. When I reached the town of Chinhai at the mouth of the Ningpo River, I found that some small junks were to sail that evening for Chapu, and I lost no time in securing a passage on board one of them. I was surprised at my success thus far as I had anticipated my greatest, if not my only, difficulty would have been in making a start. I found afterwards that I was indebted for this to my Chinese servant, who happened to be a native of Chinhai, and knew the captain of the junk. He persuaded him that there was no harm in my going by that route, and at all events that he could easily land me at Chapu, and that nobody would know how I had come there. In the evening, after many delays on account of wind and tide, and also with the view of securing more passengers and cargo, we lifted our anchor and set sail. In crossing the Bay of Hangchow, the tide runs very rapidly, and the Chinese junks and boats never go across without a fair or leading wind. I shall never forget the strange and motley group of passengers who were my fellow travellers in this little vessel. We were all huddled together in the centre cabin, and our beds were spread down on each side, merely leaving room for us to walk down the middle. Some of the passengers were respectable merchants, and even these had something filthy and disagreeable about them. 
Little insects, whose names sound harsh to ears polite, were charitably supported in great numbers amongst the warm folds of their dresses. The first thing I did when my bed was spread down was to surround it with my trunks, gun case, and other box or two, to prevent, if possible, any visitors of this description from leaving their rightful lord and master and taking up their quarters with me. With all my care, it was next to impossible to keep myself apart from the Chinese, owing to the motion of the little vessel, which sometimes sent us rolling from one side to the other. A great part of the night was spent by the Chinese in smoking opium and tobacco. When morning dawned, the scene which the cabin presented was a strange one. Nearly all the passengers were sound asleep. They were lying in heaps, here and there, as they had been tossed and wedged by the motion of the vessel during the night. Their features and appearance, as seen in the twilight of the summer morning, were striking to the eye of a foreigner. I almost fancied that I could read the characters of the different beings who lay stretched before me. There was the habitual opium smoker, there was no mistaking him. His looks were pale and haggard, his breathing quick and disturbed, and so thin was he that his cheekbones seemed piercing the skin. Some seemed careworn with business, and others again apparently slept soundly with hearts light and joyous. All had the forepart of their heads shaved, and their tails lay about in wild confusion. We were now far on our way across the bay, having had a fair wind and tide during the great part of the night, and the hills near Chapu were already visible on the horizon to the northward. All hands were soon busily engaged in getting breakfast ready. A Chinese sea breakfast consists chiefly of rice, fish, and vegetables. The proprietors of the junk provide food for the passengers, for which they charge a small sum from each, independent of the passage money. If the passengers do not choose to have breakfast or dinner, they are not required to pay for it. When breakfast was ended, some began to smoke opium and others tobacco, after which most of them went to bed again and were soon fast asleep. The Chinese, when traveling, do little else than eat, smoke, and sleep. During the whole time I was traveling in the country, I never remembered seeing one Chinese engaged in reading. At about eleven in the forenoon, we came to anchor in a muddy bay abreast the city of Chapu, where many of the junks were high and dry at low water. I had my luggage put into a small sandpan and rowed for the shore. You had better take off your shoes and stockings and draw up your trousers, said one of the Chinese boatmen as we were getting near the landing place. The prudence and necessity of this advice was soon apparent, for when the boat touched the beach I found that I had to walk a quarter of a mile up to the knees in mud before I could get to firm ground. Now came the critical part of my expedition. When I had got through the mud, I inquired for the nearest spring and commenced my ablutions, making no attempt to disguise myself as I was dressed in the common English garb. Long before I had finished washing, I was surrounded by some hundreds of natives, who seemed perfectly astonished at the sight of an Englishman. Although this place had been attacked and taken during the late war, all sorts of inquiries were made regarding me. Where had I come from? Where was I bound for? What were my objects? and a hundred other questions were put to me, or to those who accompanied me. All were, however, quite civil, and did not attempt to annoy me in the slightest degree. I now walked to some hills near the city, and inspected their vegetation. On the way I visited some temples which had been battered down by our troops during the war, and which still remained in the same ruinous condition. Hundreds of people followed me to the hills, the view from which was one of the finest I ever saw in this country. Here it is that the hills of the south end and the wide plain of Yangtze Kayang commences. On one side, looking towards the south and west, mountains are seen towering in all their grandeur. Whilst on the north side, the eye rests on a rich, level plain, watered by its thousand canals, and dotted all over with towns and villages, peopled with an immense number of industrious and happy human beings. Chapu and the country which surrounds it may well be called the Garden of China. After inspecting the hills, I went down into the Tartar city of Chapu. The suburbs are large and populous, but the walled city itself is not very extensive. It is a square, and the circuit of the walls is not more than three miles. They seem very old, and are surrounded by a moat, which also serves the purpose of a canal. Here the Tartar troops and their families reside, living entirely apart from the Chinese inhabitants of the town. The streets, houses, and shops are of the same kind of those which I have already described, Indeed, so like is one town in China to another, that if a traveller well acquainted with the northern cities was set down blindfolded in one of them, he would have had the greatest difficulty in saying whether it was Chapu, Ningpo, or Shanghai. 
i observed in the shops a considerable quantity of japanese goods which are brought annually to this place by the junks which trade with japan by the time i had examined all the chief objects of interest it was late in the afternoon and i began to think of leaving the city and taking the road for shanghai i had already taken measures by means of my servant to find the part of the canal from which shanghai boats started and thither proceeded with the intention of engaging a boat a numerous crowd had surrounded and accompanied me during the whole of the day but now that i was on the eve of taking my departure it was greatly augmented every tree every street lane window and housetop was crowded with human beings all however perfectly harmless and civil when i reached the canal and attempted to speak with one of the boatmen the crowd pressed after me in such numbers that the boat had i got on board would probably have been swamped the poor boatmen were so frightened that no reward which i could hold out would induce them to give me a passage they begged and prayed me not to enter into their boats as some accident would happen from the number of persons whom nothing could prevent from crowding in after me i was now in a dilemma and i scarcely knew how to get out of it at last i determined much against my inclinations to go to the mandarins it was a bad plan to have anything to do with chinese officials when it can be possibly avoided but in this case there was no help for it so having inquired for the residence of the superintendent of boats i set off to call upon him followed of course by an immense mob as we were going to his house my servant came up to me and requested that i would not tell the mandarin that he was in my service or that he had anything to do in bringing me there as i could speak the language sufficiently well to make myself understood i did not need him as an interpreter and i was of course anxious not to bring him or his relations into any scrape on my account when we reached the mandarin's house the doors were thrown open and i walked boldly into the reception room it was a most difficult matter for the servants to keep out the crowd but they accomplished the task partly by threats and partly by whips which they used rather more freely than we should approve of in england this however is a common mode of punishing the rabble in china and when they know they deserve it they take it very quietly tell your master i want to see him said i in a lofty tone to one of the attendants who immediately went into an inner apartment and returned with the mandarin himself clothed in his most imposing robes of office hat button peacock feather and all i made him several very low bows which he most politely returned i am in a great hurry said i to go on to shanghai and i have been trying to engage a boat for that purpose but cannot succeed without your assistance will you have the goodness to aid me after repeating after me what i had said as is the invariable custom in chinese conversation he put the following question to me how old are you this may seem strange but it is considered complimentary by the chinese and generally amongst the first questions they put i thanked him for his inquiry and told him my age and then asked his and again proposed the question regarding the boat upon this he promised to send one of his servants to get one and in the meantime invited me to take some cake and tea which were immediately set before me the gun which i had with me was an object of great curiosity to the old man more particularly the locks and percussion caps which he told me he had never seen before during the time i was discussing the cake and tea he asked me a multiplicity of questions such as where had i come from last who had told me there was a road to shanghai this way etc etc some of which i answered and some i found it convenient not to understand at last through some blunder in the part of my servant it became known that he belonged to me a circumstance which was immediately communicated to the mandarin and who sent for him and subjected him to a close and searching examination while this was going on the mandarin of the highest rank in the city arrived having been sent for by his brother in office to hold a conference regarding me these worthies after a long consultation in a private room come out and informed me in the blandest manner that they intended to give me a free passage across the country to shanghai in a boat belonging to themselves and that to add more to my comfort they would send another boat to convey my servant and luggage this seemed at first sight remarkably kind but i had been long enough in the celestial empire to be aware of the necessity of looking narrowly into their motives in order to counteract any evil designs they might think proper to hide under their assumed kindness and civility in this instance their motives were perfectly plain to me and were simply these according to the treaty of nanking if any englishman were found beyond the boundaries which were to have been fixed at each of the five ports he was liable to be seized by the authorities and brought to the nearest british consul who in these circumstances was obliged to impose a very heavy fine upon the transgressor 
and therefore if I had accepted their kind offers, I should have found on my arrival in Shanghai that I was a prisoner instead of a guest, and should in all probability have been handed over as much to the British consul. On the other hand, if I hired my own boat and went unaccompanied by any of the Mandarin's people, I was perfectly safe according to the strict letter of the treaty, even although a complaint were lodged against me on my arrival in Shanghai. Nothing would have been done in the matter by the British consul, unless I had been bona fide taking up beyond the boundaries, which was not likely to happen, as the Chinese officials are extremely cautious in all matters of this kind in order to avoid getting themselves into trouble. I immediately determined that I would not be outdone in politeness, and therefore, with many bows and reiterated thanks, I told them that I could not think of accepting so much gratuitous kindness as I was able to pay my own expenses, and that all I required of them was simply permission to hire a boat, with three or four men, which would enable me to get on to Shanghai. They still kept on pressing their offer upon me, which I continued as firmly to refuse. Another long private conference between them was now held, which I suppose ended in a determination to try what effect could be produced on my servant, who was accordingly sent for. He was desired to tell me that the distance between Chapu and Shanghai was very great, and that the roads were infested with bands of robbers who were sure to attack us, and that they could not answer for the consequences unless another boat and some of their own soldiers went along with us for protection. Tell them, said I, that I have made up my mind to travel in my usual way, and that no arguments which can be used will still induce me to change my opinion, and that the arms which I have shown them are quite sufficient to repel the attacks of any robbers whom I may meet on the road. As a last resource, they sent an officer and his servant to me, who said that they were going to Shanghai, and would be extremely obliged if I would allow them to accompany me. I was obliged to meet even this civil response with a refusal, and the mandarins, finding that they must either use force or allow me to have my own way, finally gave up the contest. A boatman now made his appearance, and announced that he was ready to proceed to Shanghai. When I rose to take my leave, I found that all the servants and retainers had been ordered out for the purpose of keeping off the crowd and seeing me safely into the boat. The two mandarins accompanied me, and we marched off to the canal in grand style. The crowd which had assembled was immense, but they were all perfectly quiet and civil. When we reached the landing place, I thanked my two friends for their kindness and bid them adieu. Then, stepping into the boat, she was pushed out into the stream, and we soon left the crowd in the Tartar city far behind us. The country through which we passed was perfectly level, highly cultivated, and more richly wooded than any of the lowlands which I had visited before. It was getting dark when we reached a town of considerable size, named Pinghu, which is distant only a few miles from Chapu, and I determined to remain there for the night. When the morning dawned, I roused the Chinamen, and we proceeded on our journey. We now passed through the extensive silk district, where the mulberry tree was the principal object of cultivation. The natives of this time, May 18th, were busily employed in gathering the leaves and feeding the silkworms with them. The mulberry trees are all grafted and produce very fine thick leaves. I obtained a plant, which is now alive in England, in order to determine the particular variety and whether it is different from the kinds which are used for the purpose in Europe. It was not yet, however, in a sufficiently advanced state for this to be ascertained. One thing, however, is certain, that the silk produced in this district is considered as being amongst the finest in China. But whether this is owing to the particular variety of mulberry tree used in feeding the worms, or to climate and soil, still remains to be ascertained. The trees, or rather bushes, are planted in rows, the banks of the canals being a favorite situation, and they are not allowed to grow more than from four to six feet in height. The natives set to work with a pair of strong scissors and cut all the young shoots off close by the stump, and they are then either stripped of their leaves or taken home in bundles and stripped afterwards. Before this operation takes place, the plants seem in a high state of health, producing vigorous shoots and fine, large, and thick, shining leaves. After the leaves have been taken off, the bushes look like a collection of dead stumps, and in the middle of summer have a curious wintry appearance. But the rain which falls copiously, and the fertility of the soil, soon revive a succulent plant like the mulberry. The Chinese seem very particular in stirring up the earth amongst the roots of the bushes immediately after the young branches and leaves have been taken off, and the plantations appear to have great attention paid to them. The farms are small, and are generally worked by the family and relatives of the farmer, who not only plant, graft, and cultivate the mulberry, but also gather the leaves, feed the silkworms, and wind the silk off the cocoons. 
During my progress through the silk district, I visited a great number of cottages where the worms are feeding. They are commonly kept in dark rooms, fitted up with shelves placed one above another from the ground to the roof of the house. The worms are kept and fed in round bamboo sieves placed among these shelves so that any one of the sieves may be taken out and examined at pleasure. The poor natives were greatly surprised when they saw a foreigner coming amongst them and generally supposed that I intended to rob them of their silkworms. In all the villages which I visited, they uniformly denied that they had any feeding rooms, although the leaves and stems of the mulberry about their doors told a different tale. But they never failed to direct me to go into some other part of the country, where they assured me I should find them. Before we parted, however, they generally gained confidence and showed me their collection of worms, as well as their mode of managing them. After passing through the Hangchow Silk District, and keeping on in an easterly direction, we reached, late in the evening, a large town named Songkyang Fu, which is about 30 miles to the west of Shanghai, and stopped for the night under its ramparts. By daybreak the next morning we were again in our road and reached Shanghai on the afternoon of the same day. Having taken up my abode in the house of my friend Mr. Mackenzie, I was surprised in going downstairs next morning to find one of my Chapu acquaintances, the officer already mentioned, in close conversation with the Chinese servants but I now cared very little about the matter, knowing perfectly how the business must end. There is no doubt that the whole affair had been reported to the Tao Tai, or head Mandarin of Shanghai, and that he would be obliged for his own sake to take some little notice of it. A day or two afterwards, I had the honour to receive the following letter from H.B.M. Consul, and a translation of a note which had been sent to him by the Tao Tai. H.B.M. Consulate, Shanghai, 21st May, 1845. Sir, the annexed translation of a note received this morning from the Tao Tai is transmitted to you for an explanation, which I request may be afforded as soon as possible. I have the honour to be, Sir, yours, etc. G. Balfour, HBM Consul for Shanghai. The enclosed ran as follows. I have just heard that a merchant of your honourable mention, Fortune, and his attendant, linguist Ye Mingchu, were coming from Tinghai to Shanghai, and met with a breeze at sea when the vessel drifted to Chapu, that the local officers in Shekiang then protected and sent them along the coast, and that they are living at the Mingle warehouse. I would therefore trouble the Honorable Consul to make inquiry which ship he is the merchant and let me know. This is written wishing you daily happiness. True translation, signed, W. H. Medhurst, Interpreter. When I perused this document I could not but admire the cunning of the old man. He knew perfectly well that it did not contain one word of truth, that I was not coming from Tinghai, but from Ningpo, that I met with no breeze at sea except that which had quietly brought us to the desired port, and lastly that I had not been sent along the coast, but had had a very pleasant journey through the interior of the country. I saw at once that the object of the good old Tautai was to allow me to deny the truth of his statements and upon the principle that no man is bound to incriminate himself, I sent the following answer to Her Majesty's Consul, which was doubtless perfectly satisfactory to the Tautai, and just what he wanted. Sir, I have the honour to acknowledge the receipt of a letter from you of yesterday's date, to which is annexed a translation of a note you had received from the Tautai of Shanghai, concerning which you request an explanation may be afforded as soon as possible. In answer of this, I beg to inform you that the circumstances noticed in the Tautai's letter do not apply to me, and he is therefore mistaken, or has been misinformed. I have the honour to be, sir, yours, etc. I need scarcely say that I heard no more of the matter, and from this I concluded that my answer must have been considered highly satisfactory. I arrived in Shanghai in good time to transact the business I had in hand, and not a little pleased at having so successfully accomplished my overland journey. End of chapter 19. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 of Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Steve Cullen, Ottawa, Canada. When I finished my business in Shanghai, I left that city and sailed for Fu Chao Fu on the River Min. Fu Chao Fu is the capital of the province of Fukien, 
situated in twenty five degrees thirty minutes north latitude near the celebrated bohe hills and about halfway between chusen and canton on approaching the entrance to the min we anchored under the lee of some islands named the white dogs for the purpose of procuring a fisherman who could pilot the vessel into the river as the entrance is rather difficult for a stranger having been until very lately but imperfectly surveyed going to the shore for that purpose in the ship's boat we found a small fishing village inhabited by men and boys most of whom had a piratical and forbidding appearance it seems that these people only come here at certain periods of the year to fish and when the season is past they move to more comfortable quarters on the mainland no women are ever allowed to inhabit the island having picked out the most weather-beaten man we could find we asked him if he knew the passage to the min and if he could take a vessel in which drew three fathoms of water he immediately answered in the affirmative but when we wanted him to come on board he altered his mind and hesitated probably because he had not confidence in us or it might be he was frightened at the consequences not knowing how his conduct would be viewed by the authorities mr shaw captain freeman and myself now held a conference as to what was to be done a ship and a valuable cargo were at stake the numerous and dangerous sandbanks near the mouth of the river were visible and as the man only refused us his service through fear and ignorance we concluded that as necessity has no law there could be no great harm in taking him against his will we accordingly pulled alongside his little junk and took him and it off to the ship where he very soon got over all his fears the chinese are certainly a strange and unaccountable race never in my life did i witness greater apathy than was shown by this boat's crew when we took them off to the ship their companions too for there were several boats in the little bay scarcely even looked at us or manifested the least surprise when they saw our men board the boat got her anchor up and hoist her sail the next morning our pilot got the ship under way and took us into the river min by a passage not marked in our charts he evinced the most perfect acquaintance with the depth of the water at every port and at last anchored us in safety abreast of a small temple a few miles from the mouth of the river before we came to the most dangerous point where we had to pass between two sandbanks the captain very quietly informed him that if he made any mistake and got the ship aground he should have his tail cut off a punishment very nearly the greatest which could be inflicted on a chinaman when told he shrugged up his shoulders gave a sly look and said very well we shall see by and by the anchorage being reached in safety the old man thought it was now his time for a joke and turning triumphantly round with his tail in one of his hands exclaimed now what about the tail is it to be cut off or not or are you satisfied the passage by which we entered the river is called by the natives the wu hu mun or the five tiger gate and here we saw a most singular rock or island which was cleft as it were into five pyramids and is much revered by the chinese sailor in fact he seems to look upon it as representing the gods of the ocean and he fails not to offer up his thanks and his offerings every time he passes by it on returning from the sea the chinese are often taunted with their indifference to the religion which they profess and yet the earnest and devout manner in which they burn incense and worship at their holy places would put to the blush many of the professors of a holier and purer faith the scenery at the mouth of the min and towards fu chow fu is striking and beautiful the river itself varies much in width and depth according to the district through which it flows near its mouth and at some parts where the country between it and the hills is flat it is not less than a mile in width but at other parts where the mountains come almost to the water's edge the river is narrow deep and rapid there were two or three such places between the mouth of the min and the city of fuchaofu the whole of this district is hilly many of the mountains being at least three thousand feet high and at this season of the year when thunderstorms were almost of daily occurrence the effects produced by them amongst these mountains were grand and sublime it is evident that the chinese greatly dreaded our visiting this place during the war i observed that forts had been built on all the most commanding positions on the sides of the river but most of them were now without guns and had already become dilapidated the little town and fortress of ming an a few miles up the river is beautifully situated on a hill sloping down to the water the position is so strong by nature that if manned with english troops it could defend the pass against the strongest force a few miles below the city the river is blocked up almost all the way across with stones and old junks 
which are covered on high water. I believe the intended plan of defense was to wreck all our vessels on this barrier and destroy our men by batteries erected near it. On the banks of the river are numerous temples or joss houses, built in the most romantic and beautiful situations. A fig tree, Ficus nitida, a kind of banyan, is a great favorite with the priests and is always found growing beside the temples, where its dark green leaves and wide-spreading branches afford an agreeable shade from the fierce rays of the sun. About nine miles below Fu Chao Fu, a pretty little pagoda stands on an island on the left bank of the river. Near this is the anchorage for large vessels which it would not be prudent to take up to the town. All the low hills are neatly terraced and cultivated with sweet potatoes and earth nuts, and on the more fertile of the mountains cultivation is carried on at least 2,500 feet above the level of the sea. But many of the mountains are quite barren. Bare rocks of granite are showing themselves over their surface, from amongst which springs are almost always flowing, and when the water accumulates in the glens between the hills, it forms numerous beautiful cascades. As it tumbles down into the Min, some parts of the region are well wooded, at least for China, and viewing the scenery as a whole, the beautiful river, winding its way between the mountains, its islands, its temples, its villages and fortresses, I think, although not the richest, it is the most romantic and beautiful part of the country which has come under my observation. The city and suburbs of Fu Chao Fu stand in an opening amongst the hills, about twenty miles from the mouth of the Min. The river runs through the suburbs, which are connected by the celebrated bridge called the Wan Shou, or Myriads of Ages which was always said to consist of one hundred arches. It is not an arched bridge at all, but it is nevertheless a wonderful structure, being about two thousand feet in length and having fifty strong pillars of stone, with large slabs of granite reaching from the one to the other, and forming the top of the bridge. During the rains the water rushes through these divisions with awful rapidity, and as the bridge has evidently stood for many ages, it is a proof of the substantial manner in which it is originally built. Leaving the ship at the mouth of the Min, Mr. Shaw, Captain Freeman, and myself started in a native boat to go up to the city. When we were getting into the boat, our old friend the pilot, who by this time had become quite at home amongst us, came and begged us to give him a passage as far up as the first town we were to pass on our way. We inquired why he did not go back again to his fishing at the White Dog Island. His reply was, I should get robbed by pirates of all the money you have given me for pilotage. I must first make sure of it by depositing it in the hands of a friend of mine in the town. After that is done, I shall return to the island. We were nearly two days in getting up to the city, owing to the rapidity of the stream caused by the late heavy rains. We landed near the bridge already noticed, and immediately inquired for the house of the Channel Consul, who, we were informed, lived in a temple situated within the city and about three miles from the landing place. As nearly the whole of the streets in the suburbs were under water at the time, in some parts to the depth of four feet, it was impossible to walk this distance, nor was it necessary to make the attempt, for chairmen surrounded us in great numbers, and were as determined on putting us into their chairs as a London conductor is to have passengers for his omnibus. We willingly yielded to their solicitations, and got into chairs and set off for the consular residence. The people here had seen but few foreigners, and were particularly impertinent and annoying. Hundreds followed us and crowded round the chairs. Kwang Yanga, Kwang Yanga, their term for foreigners, was rung in our ears from all sides, and frequently other appellations of a much worse signification. Our Chinese servants, who walked by our side, were attacked and reviled for having any connection with us. In one of the streets the water was so deep that I was obliged to stand up on the seat of the chair, and even then it reached my feet. Here the crowd became very abusive, and commenced throwing water over us. At first our servants bore this treatment pretty well, but their patience was at last exhausted, and they turned upon the assailants. The scene was now both amusing and disagreeable. Luckily I happened to be a little in advance, and was therefore pretty well out of the melee. But Captain Freeman came in for his full share of it, and was completely soaked through. When we got within the city walls we were not molested further, owing, I suppose, to the greater strength of the police. The city is walled and fortified upon the same plan as Ningpo and Shanghai, and is at least eight or nine miles in circumference, having as usual east, west, north, and south gates. At various points on the walls, as well as above the gates, 
guardhouses were erected, each containing guns, some of which, according to the writings on them, were cast about the commencement of the last war. A small area between the north and south gates is not built upon, but the greater part of the space within the walls is densely covered with houses. There were two rather handsome pagodas and some small hills on which temples are built, and where a good view of the town and suburbs may be obtained. On one of these hills the British consul has his residence. The streets in all Chinese cities have much the same appearance. Some are a little wider than others, and have better and more attractive shops, but by far the greater part of them are narrow and dirty, and Fu Chao Fu certainly forms no exception to the general rule. A large trade appears to be carried on here in copper, judging from the number of shops tilled with manufactured articles of that metal, particularly of gongs, of which I observed an immense number of all sizes. This copper is brought here principally in junks from Lu Chu. They also bring a considerable quantity of gold. Both metals are said to be originally the exports of Japan. I went on board two of these junks at the mouth of the Min, which were bound to Luchu, and were loaded with tea oil, which they told me they had taken in exchange for their copper. A great quantity of iron is manufactured here, and wire drawing is carried on extensively. The great export trade of the port, however, is in wood which is floated down the men in large quantities and covers many acres in the suburbs near the riverside. Hundreds of junks from Amoy, Ningpo, Chapu, and some even from as far north as the province of Shantung and the Bay of Pichi Li are constantly employed in this trade. The wood is chiefly a sort of common pine, employed in the building of houses, and is generally cut into lengths suited to that purpose before it is shipped. Good planks of fine hardwood can also be had in any quantity at this place. The wood junks are loaded with great skill, and a great part of their cargo being lashed to their sides, thus making them about three times their ordinary width. Banking is carried on to a greater extent in Fu Chao Fu than in other towns which I have visited. Paper notes are a common medium of exchange in which the people have the greatest confidence, preferring them to dollars or cash. Some of the notes are as low as 400 cash, about 1,800 English money. Others are for very large sums. The people here are generally much cleaner in their habits and appear to be a more attractive race than those in the northern towns. In fact, they approach more nearly to the natives of Canton than to any other in these respects. I was much surprised to find them consuming beef and even milk in considerable quantities, articles which are never used by the inhabitants of the other districts where I have been Indeed, everywhere else the Chinese are wont to express their astonishment when they saw the English using such articles of food. Indeed, everywhere else the Chinese are wont to express their astonishment when they see the English using such articles of food. The ladies of Fu Chao Fu are particularly fond of flowers, artificial as well as natural. For the decoration of their hair, the rustic cottage beauty employs the more large and gaudy, such as the red hibiscus, while the refined damsels prefer the jasmine, tuberose, and others of that description. Artificial flowers, however, are more in use than the natural ones. The population of Fu Chao Fu has been estimated at about half a million, and I have no doubt that if the suburbs and numerous villages in the vicinity be taken into account, the number is not overstated. Up to the time when I left China, little or nothing had been done here in the way of trade, and I cannot help thinking that its advantages in this respect have been greatly overrated. It is never likely to be a place of as great importance to England as the more northerly port of Shanghai, and for this very simple reason, the physical nature of the country is against it. The whole of the surrounding region is mountainous, the rivers are rapid and in some places shallow, and are often liable to rain floods. There are consequently many impediments in the way of a free transmission of goods into the interior of the country. Fu Chao Fu is supposed to possess great advantages, owing to its being near the Bohe or Black Tea District, and it was thought at one time that it might form the great emporium for the export of this article to Europe and America. This opinion, however, has hitherto proved fallacious, and I believe it is now ascertained that the Black Teas can be brought more readily to Shanghai and Ningpo than to Fu Chao Fu, especially since the Bohe Teas have sunk in estimation and other districts to the northward having taken the place of the Bohe Hills, are now furnishing black teas of commerce. In addition to all these disadvantages, the natives seem a lawless and turbulent race, 
having all the characteristics of those in the Canton province, and like them, being inveterate in their hatred of foreigners, and full of conceit as to their own importance and power. Several very serious disturbances have taken place at the port since it was open to the British. After paying our visit to the English consul, we returned to the suburbs to look out for a house where we could put up during our stay. When we got back to the river, we found all our luggage and servants already safely lodged in the house of a person who had been ordered by the mandarins to lodge us and look after us. We were glad to get indoors from the insulting crowd, and were consequently not very particular as to the quarters. We soon found, however, that we were very strictly watched, and that we could not move anywhere without the fact being communicated to the mandarins. My first object was to find out all the gardens and nurseries in the district. The late G. Tradescant Lay, Esquire, the first consul here, who took a great interest in botanical pursuits, had unfortunately left this place for Amoy. All was, therefore, uphill work, as it used to be in the more northern towns when I first visited them. After a great deal of exertion and annoyance, I found out a number of gardens and nurseries, both in the town and in the surrounding country, and obtained a few new plants. The valley of the Min was still flooded in many parts, and travelling over it was a very serious matter. One morning I started for a place at a considerable distance in the country, accompanied by a guide and a coolie. I took the coolie that he might carry me over those low flats which were known to be still flooded. We got on pretty well for some time, but the tide beginning to rise, I soon found that I must either retrace my steps or make up my mind to disregard the water, as the whole of the paths in our route were flooded. Unwilling to return, I went on, often wading up to my middle. The same thing occurred during several successive days, and this under a burning sun, with a temperature of at least 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Few constitutions could stand this with impunity, and I suffered severely for it afterwards. I was now anxious to proceed further into the country, particularly into the hilly black tea district. But the mandarins, who were informed of all my movements by their spies, did everything in their power to dissuade me from making the attempt. They told the consul, and induced him to believe them, that their only reason for wishing to prevent my going into the interior was that the natives are in a state which make it unsafe for a foreigner to trust himself amongst them, that by and by they would communicate with the magistrates in the district to which I wanted to go, and that after this was done I might proceed with safety. But I had had too much to do with the Chinese authorities in various parts of the country to place any reliance on what they said, more particularly when I knew they had some end to gain. In the present instance, their object was to procrastinate matters from day to day until I should be obliged to leave the district. When the Chinese have an end to gain, the only question with them is whether they are most likely to succeed by telling the truth or telling lies. Either method is resorted to as may best suit their purpose, with a slight preference, perhaps, for the latter. When they found that, notwithstanding all their descriptions of the fierce and hostile disposition of the people, I was still determined to go and they declared that no tea was grown in this district, being fully persuaded that an Englishman could have no other object in exploring the country than to see the cultivation of his favorite beverage. Indeed, every Chinaman firmly believes that we could not continue to exist as a nation were it not for the productions of the Celestial Empire. It has been stated that His Celestial Majesty, the Emperor himself, during the war recommended his subjects to use every means in their power to prevent the English from getting tea and rhubarb, the one being what they lived upon, and the other their medicine, without which, his majesty said, they could not continue to exist for any length of time, and consequently would be more easily conquered in this way than by the sword. I told the mandarins that I did not care whether there were tea farms on these hills or not, but that, to cut the matter short, I was determined to go and see. Accordingly, on the following morning I started early, taking the road for the tea hills. The flat country through which I passed between the north side of the city and the mountains, is chiefly cultivated with rice, sugarcane, ginger, and tobacco. On the sides of the little hills, and also for a considerable distance up the loftier ranges, large quantities of sweet potatoes and earth nuts are grown during the summer season. But as we ascend, the mountains become more rugged, cultivation ceases, and plants indigenous to the country alone show themselves. On my journey over these mountains I came to the conclusion that their native flora was of the intermediate character between those of the southern and northern provinces. 
the tropical species of the south being found in the lowlands and the species of more northern latitudes inhabiting the mountains two thousand or three thousand feet above the level of the sea in the low valleys the ficus nitida attains a large size and is a great favorite with the inhabitants it is always seen near the villages and temples after toiling up one of the celebrated mountain passes which is paved all the way and has a house of refreshment about halfway up i reached the summit of the mountain the highest land in this part of china a glorious prospect was spread before me the valley of the min stretching far across to the other hills the city of fu chao fu with its pagodas temples and watchtowers standing in the centre of the plain and the broad river winding smoothly along in its course of the sea mountain towering above mountain and the whole striking the mind with wonder and admiration among these mountains and at a height of two thousand and three thousand feet above the level of the sea i found the black tea district which i was anxious to see and the existence of which had been denied by my affectionate friends the mandarins having been in several green tea countries further north i was desirous to ascertain clearly whether the plant was the same species in both places or whether as generally believed they were different i have stated in a former chapter that the tea plant of the northern green tea districts is the true thea viridis of botanists i was now fortunate enough not only to find an extensive tea district but also to be present when the natives were picking and preparing the leaves and i not only procured specimens for my herbarium but also a living plant which i afterwards took to the green tea hills of the north and found on minute comparison that it was identical with the thea viridis the other words the black and green teas which generally come to england from the northern provinces of china are made from the same species and the difference of colour flavour etc is solely the result of different modes of preparation in this region i met with no plants which i had not seen before in other parts of the country i observed the lance-leaved pine cunninghamia lanceolata in great abundance indeed this species and the more common pinus sinensis are almost the only trees of any size which grow in this mountainous district the natives amongst these hills were much surprised at the sight of a foreigner and came crowding from all quarters to see me they were however much more civil and respectful than their countrymen in the lowlands and at fu chao fu on my return from this excursion i devoted most of my time to the examination of nurseries in the vicinity of the sea they contained some interesting plants the celebrated fingered citron so common in the shops throughout china seems to be cultivated in great perfection in this part of the country in fact it appears to be its natural locality the district round fu chao fu seems to be the great camellia garden of china and in no other part of the country did i ever see these plants in such perfect health or so beautifully cultivated the ixerus and hydrangeas are also particularly well grown and handsome the latter invariably producing flowers of the deepest blue much deeper than i have ever seen them in england they are grown in a fine rich loam which contains some chemical ingredient and which is the cause of their deep color here as well as further north the farmer grows crops of wheat and green vegetables during the winter months a great part of the low country at least all that is capable of being flooded is cultivated with rice during the summer and autumn the first crop is ripe in july and the second is planted between the rows of the former in the same manner as in the northern provinces and ripens in the autumn large quantities of tobacco are grown in the province the farmers cultivate this plant with very great care and take every means to have the leaves large and fine for this purpose all the flowers are regularly picked off and also all the small and useless leaves as soon as they are formed sugar and ginger are likewise grown to a greater extent in this part of china than in any other with which i am acquainted and crops of sweet potatoes and earth nuts abound on the sides of the hills amongst fruits the plums are good but inferior to what we have in england the peaches are curiously formed but worthless what may be more properly called chinese fruits such as lychees longans and wangpis are however excellent the climate suiting them admirably when i was here in july the lychee trees were covered with their fine red fruit and were very beautiful the fruit contrasted so well with the deep clear green foliage large quantities of oranges citrons and pumelos are also found in the district of the min but none of them were ripe at this season i saw for the first time the tree commonly called the chinese olive canarium from the resemblance its fruit bears to the olive of europe also the chinese date 
Zisiphus, which produces a fruit not unlike the date imported into England. In the fields in the vicinity of Fu Chao Fu, large quantities of the sweet-scented Jasminum Sambac are cultivated. It is used to decorate the hair of the ladies and to garnish the tables of the wealthy. I believe that all the gardens, both in the north and south, are supplied with this favorite flower from the province of Fokien. Various other shrubs, such as Mariah exotica, Aglaia adorata, and Cloranthus inconspicuous, are grown for their blooms, which are used for mixing with the tea. The temperature of Fu Chao Fu appears to be intermediate between that of Hong Kong in the south and Shanghai in the north. In June and in the beginning of July, the thermometer ranges from 85 degrees to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and about the middle of the latter month it rose to 100 degrees, which I believe it seldom exceeds. The following table was kept by the late Mr. G. Tradescant Lay. 1844, August, 96 degrees maximum, 82 degrees minimum. September, 90 degrees maximum, 82 degrees minimum. October, 86 degrees maximum, 71 degrees minimum. November, 78 degrees maximum, 65 degrees minimum. December, 75 degrees maximum, 44 degrees minimum. 1845, January, 72 degrees maximum, 44 degrees minimum. The weather is generally unsettled and wet about the time the summer monsoon changes, that is, from April to June, and the district is visited by heavy thunderstorms in July and part of August. Towards the end of August, in September, and in the beginning of October, it is generally very dry. The monsoon now changes again to the northeast, and the weather becomes variable and continues so during the winter months. During my stay here I received a great deal of kindness from Mr. Walker of H.M. Consulate. The natives continued to the last troublesome and annoying, and I was very glad when my labors in the district were ended. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of a Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. At the time when I visited Fu Chao Fu, although it was open to the English as a place of trade and had a British consul, it was little known in a mercantile point of view. The entrance to the river Min was described as extremely difficult and dangerous, and consequently few foreign vessels ventured to touch at this port. When, therefore, my botanical researches were completed, I was ready to return north to Shanghai. I was obliged to apply for a passage in a Chinese junk, a whole fleet of which were to sail in a few days for Ningpo and Chapu. Knowing the dislike and jealousy which most of the natives manifest towards foreigners, I had some doubt whether I should be able to induce them to take me as a passenger, and in that event I had determined to go down to the mouth of the river and, sans ceremonie, get on board whether they consented or not. I was, therefore, agreeably surprised when, on sending my servant to make inquiries as to the time when they were likely to sail, he returned, bringing with him the captain and some of the sailors, who were all not only willing but most anxious that I should go with them. The principal part of the cargo carried by the Ningpo and Chapu junks is wood. This is stowed on deck, and also lashed firmly to the gunwales and sides with large ropes of bamboo which are of great strength. Several hundreds of these vessels may be seen loading at the port of Fu Chao Fu, particularly in the summer season, when the monsoon is fair for their voyage home. The mandarins are extremely jealous of so large a fleet, and will not allow them to carry guns, even for their own defense evidently fearing that some day or other these might be turned against the government. The consequence of this regulation is that these poor sailors and all they possess on board often fall an easy prey to the pirates who abound all along this coast. When the cargo was completed, the captain of the junk came to inform me that he was ready to start and requested me to come on board. Whilst I was packing up my luggage, he began to examine my firearms very minutely and said to me, I hope your gun is a good one, and that you have plenty of powder and shot. What is your reason for putting this question? said I. I am sure we shall have nothing to shoot in our voyage up the coast. Oh, yes, you will, answered he. We are very likely to be attacked by the Jandos, who swarm outside amongst the islands. Who are the Jandos? said I, to my servant, never having heard the name before. Oh, they are pirates, said he, and we are all very much frightened at them. Nonsense, I exclaimed. 
no pirates will attack us and if they do they will repent it at this time i had no idea that the coast was so infested with these lawless characters and i put it all down to the cowardice of my informants as soon as i got on board we hove up the anchor and dropped down to the mouth of the min we here found a large fleet of junks about one hundred and seventy sail all like ourselves loaded with wood and ready to start for the northern parts of ningpo and chapu that evening a meeting of the captains was held on board of our vessel and a deputation appointed to wait upon the mandarins to request them to send a convoy of war junks to protect the fleet from the pirates these negotiations were carried on for several days but the demands of the mandarins were so exorbitant that the junk people would not comply with them and it was at last determined to sail without the convoy just as they came to this decision the wind changed and blew a gale from the north for three days when it veered round to the south and blew nearly as strong from that quarter and for the same space of time these vessels never go to sea in stormy weather even if the wind is fair and what with the gales of wind and negotiations with the mandarins i was obliged to content myself with a junk life for a fortnight at the mouth of the river as long as i enjoyed health i got on well enough but the exposure during the past summer particularly at fu chow fu had gradually undermined my constitution and the fever which was probably kept off for a certain time by bodily exertion now seized me and compelled me to take my cot where i lay for a number of days insensible at intervals at times when when consciousness returned i certainly thought that my travels were drawing to a close and that my grave should be a lonely one on the banks of the min it seemed hard for me to die in a land of strangers without a friend or countryman to close my eyes or follow me to my last resting place and home friends and country how doubly dear did they seem to me then the wind having been fair for several days and the weather appearing settled the captain of the junk came down to the place where i lay and told me they intended to sail on the following morning he again inquired if i had my gun and pistols in proper order and plenty of powder and ball still imagining that they were exaggerating the dangers of the voyage i laughed and said do not be afraid i have everything in order and i will undertake to beat off any pirates who may attack us nevertheless i clearly saw that both captain and sailors were really uneasy about the voyage and would have been very glad of another gale to afford a pretext for deferring it a little longer they had however no further excuse for delay and it was settled that the whole fleet would sail early the next day the chinese sailor never goes to sea without first presenting an offering to the gods to propitiate them in order that the voyage may be a speedy and successful one accordingly on this day the cabin of our junk was set in order and the tables covered with dishes of pork mutton fruits and vegetables candles and incense were burned upon the tables for a short time and the whole business had something solemn and imposing about it the cook who seemed to be the high priest conducted all the ceremonies on other days as well as this it was part of his duty to light the candles in the little temple where the gods were kept as well as to burn incense and prostrate himself before them early on the following morning the whole fleet was in motion starting all together for the sake of mutual protection the wind and tide were both fair and we proceeded along the coast with great rapidity and were soon out of sight of the min and its beautiful and romantic scenery the plan of mutual protection soon seemed to be abandoned and the vessel separated into threes and fours each getting on as well and as fast as it could about four o'clock in the afternoon and when we were some fifty or sixty miles from the min the captain and pilot came hurriedly down to my cabin and informed me that they saw a number of jandus right ahead laying in wait for us i ridiculed the idea and told them that they imagined every junk they saw to be a pirate but they still maintained that they were so and i therefore considered it prudent to be prepared for the worst i got out of bed ill and feverish as i was and carefully examined my firearms clearing the nipples of my gun and pistols and putting on fresh caps i also rammed down a ball upon the top of each charge of shot in my gun put a pistol in each side pocket and patiently waited for the result by the aid of a small pocket telescope i could see as the nearest junk approached that her deck was crowded with men i then had no longer any doubts regarding her intentions the pilot the intelligent old man now came up to me and said that he thought resistance was of no use i might manage to beat off one junk or even two but that i had no chance with five of them being at the time in no mood to take advice or be dictated to by any one i ordered him off to look after his own duty i knew perfectly well that if we were taken by pirates i had not the slightest chance of escape 
for the first thing they would do would be to knock me on the head and throw me overboard, as they would deem it dangerous to themselves were I to get away. At the same time, I must confess I had little hopes of being able to beat off such a number, and devoutly wished myself anywhere rather than where I was. The scene around me was a strange one. The captain, pilot, and one or two native passengers were taking up the boards of the cabin floor and putting their money and other valuables out of sight amongst the ballast. The common sailors, too, had their copper cash, or tsien, to hide, and the whole place was in a state of bustle and confusion. When all their more valuable property was hidden, they began to make some preparations for defense. Baskets of small stones were brought up from the hold and emptied out in the most convenient parts of the deck and were intended to be used instead of firearms when the pirates came to close quarters. This is a common mode of defense in various parts of China, and is effectual enough when the enemy has only similar weapons to bring against them. But on the coast of Fokien, where we were now, all the pirate junks carried guns, and consequently a whole deck load of stones could be of very little use against them. During the general bustle, I missed my own servant for a short time. When he returned to me, he had made such a change in his appearance that I did not recognize him. He was literally clothed in rags, which he had borrowed from the sailors, all of whom had also put on their very worst clothes. When I asked him the reason for this change in his outward man, he told me that the pirates only made those persons prisoners who had money and were likely to pay handsomely for their ransom, and that they would not think it worth their while to lay hold of a man in rags. I was surrounded by several of the crew, who might well be called Job's comforters, some suggesting one thing and some another, and many proposed that we should bring the junk round and run back to the men. The nearest pirate was now within two hundred or three hundred yards of us, and putting her helm down gave us a broadside from her guns. All was now dismay and consternation on board our junk, and every man ran below except two who were at the helm. I expected every moment that these also would leave their post, and then we should have been an easy prey to the pirates. My gun is nearer you than those of the jandos, said I to the two men, and if you move from the helm, depend upon it that I will shoot you. The poor fellows looked very uncomfortable, but I suppose thought they had better stand the fire of the pirates than mine, and kept at their post. Large boards, heaps of old clothes, mats, and, and things of that sort which were at hand were thrown up to protect us from the shot, and as we had every stitch of sail set and a fair wind, we were going through the water at the rate of seven or eight miles an hour. The shot from the pirates fell considerably short of us, and I was therefore enabled to form an opinion of the range and power of their guns, which was of some use to me. Assistance from our cowardly crew was quite out of the question, for there was not a man amongst them brave enough to use the stones which had been brought on deck, and which perhaps might have been of some little use when the pirates came nearer. The fair wind and all the press of sail which we had crowded on the junk proved of no use, for our pursuers, who had much faster sailing vessels, were gaining rapidly upon us. Again the nearest pirate fired upon us. The shot this time fell just under our stem, and I still remained quiet, as I had determined not to fire a single shot until I was quite certain my gun would take effect. The third broadside, which followed this, came whizzing over our heads and through the sails, without, however, wounding either the men at the helm or myself. The pirates now seemed quite sure of their prize, and came down upon us hooting and yelling like demons, at the same time loading their guns, and evidently determined not to spare their shot. This was a moment of intense interest. The plan which I had formed from the first was now about to be put to the proof, and if the pirates were not the cowards which I believed them to be, nothing could save us from falling into their hands. Their fearful yells seem to be ringing in my ears even now, after this lapse of time, and when I am on the other side of the globe. The nearest junk was now within thirty yards of ours. Their guns were now loaded, and I knew that the next discharge would completely rake our decks. Now, said I to our helmsman, keep your eyes fixed on me, and the moment you see me fall flat on the deck, you must do the same, or you will be shot. I knew that the pirate, who was now on our stern, could not bring his guns to bear upon us without putting his helm down and bringing his gangway at right angles with our stern, as his guns were fired from the gangway. I therefore kept a sharp eye upon his helmsman, and the moment I saw him putting the helm down, I ordered our steersmen to fall flat on their faces behind some wood, and at the same moment did so myself. We had scarcely done so when, bang, bang, went their guns, and the shot came whizzing close over us, splintering the wood about us in all directions. Fortunately, none of us were struck. Now, Mandarin, now, they are quite close enough, cried out my companions, who did not wish to have another broadside like the last. I, being of the same opinion, raised myself above the high stern of our junk, 
and while the pirates were not more than twenty yards from us hooting and yelling i raked their decks fore and aft with shot and ball from my double-barreled gun had a thunderbolt fallen amongst them they could not have been more surprised doubtless many were wounded and probably some killed at all events the whole of the crew not fewer than forty or fifty men who a moment before crowded the deck disappeared in a marvellous manner sheltering themselves behind the bulwarks or lying flat on their faces they were so completely taken by surprise that their junk was left without a helmsman her sails flapped in the wind and as we were still carrying all sail and keeping our right course they were soon left a considerable way astern another was now bearing down upon us as boldly as his companion had done and commenced firing in the same manner having been so successful with the first i determined to follow the same plan with this one and to pay no attention to his firing until he should come to close quarters the plot now began to thicken for the first junk had gathered way again and was following in our wake although keeping at a respectful distance and three others although still further distant were making for the scene of action as fast as they could in the meantime the second was almost alongside and continued giving us a broadside now and then with their guns watching their helm as before we sheltered ourselves as well as we could at the same time my poor fellows who were steering kept begging and praying that i would fire into our pursuers as soon as possible or we should be all killed as soon as they came within twenty or thirty yards of us i gave them the contents of both barrels raking their decks as before this time the helmsman fell and doubtless several others were wounded in a minute or two i could see nothing but boards and shields which were held up by the pirates to protect themselves from my firing their junk went up into the wind for want of a helmsman and was soon left some distance behind us while i was watching this vessel our men called out to me that there was another close on our lee bow which i had not observed on account of our main sail luckily however it proved to be a ningpo wood junk like ourselves which the pirates had taken a short time before but which although manned by these rascals could do us no harm having no guns the poor ningpo crew which i could plainly see on board seemed to be very much downhearted and frightened i was afterward informed that when a junk is captured all the principal people such as the captain pilot and passengers are taken out of her and a number of the pirates go on board and take her into some of their dens amongst the islands and keep her there until a heavy ransom is paid both for the junk and the people sometimes when a ransom cannot be obtained the mast and spars and everything else which is of any value are taken out of her and she is set on fire two other piratical junks which had been following in our wake for some time when they saw what had happened would not venture any nearer and at last much to my satisfaction the whole set of them bore away now was the time for my heroical companions to come from their hiding place which they did with great alacrity hooting and yelling as the pirates had done before and in derision calling on them to come back and renew the fight the stones too were now boldly seized and thrown after the retreating junks reaching to almost a tenth part of the distance and a stranger who had not seen these gentry before would have supposed them the bravest men in existence fortunately the pirates did not think proper to accept the challenge with the captain pilot crew and passengers i was now one of the greatest and best of men in existence they actually came and knelt before me as to some superior being and expressed their deep and lasting gratitude which however did not last long the sun was now setting in all his glory behind the hills of Fokien, and many of the more devout amongst the passengers and crew did not fail to bow low in adoration and thankfulness to this supposed deity for their escape out of the hands of the pirates shortly after nightfall we arrived at one of the safe anchorages where the mandarins are too strong for the lawless bands which infest the other parts of the coast on the following morning we again got under way and proceeded the whole day without molestation in the evening we arrived at another safe anchorage or place of rendezvous but the security at this place consisted in the number and strength of the junks actually at anchor there and not in the fear which the pirates entertained for the government when we reached this place the night was fine and as it was nearly full moon it was almost as light as clay the tide too was just turning in our favour and i was most anxious to proceed on our voyage i did everything in my power to induce them to go on it was of no use however for as soon as we reached the anchorage and found a large fleet of junks the anchor was dropped and they determined to stay there all night i felt very much annoyed but saw it was no use to grumble and went quietly to bed 
In less than an hour from this time, and before I had fallen asleep, hearing a stir upon deck, I inquired what was the cause, and found that we were getting under way. This was agreeable news, but as I could not imagine what had caused them to change their minds so soon, I went upon deck to see what was going on. Our people, it appeared, had gone to sleep the moment our anchor was down. Shortly after this, the other junks, which it turned out were only waiting for the rise of the tide to enter some river in the vicinity, had all weighed anchor and gone off. All on board were now in great consternation, lest the pirates should come down upon us whilst at anchor. And no time was lost in getting it up and proceeding on our voyage, much, of course, to my satisfaction. On the following day, late in the afternoon, when I was laid up in my bed with fever, the captain came hurriedly down and informed me that another fleet of pirates were in sight and evidently lying in wait for us. I was obliged to get up, ill as I was, and when I got on deck I could see, by the aid of my telescope, six junks coming out from amongst the islands under the mainland, and evidently bearing down towards us. This time I was not so sceptical as the last. After having once seen these rascally vessels, there was no mistaking others of the same class, as they came sneaking out of the bays. Their clipper-built hulls, the cut of their sails, their raking masts, and the crowd of fellows who lined their decks all told the business they were after. It was therefore evident that we must prepare for another encounter. It now struck me that perhaps I might be able to deceive the pirates with regard to our strength, as I was afraid that I might not again be so successful with them, particularly if they found out there was only one foreigner on board, knowing that they have a great dread of foreigners and their guns. My object was to make them believe that there were a number of us, and that we were well armed. For this purpose, I got up all the spare clothes I had, and put them on the least Chinese-looking Chinamen on board. At the same time I desired them to collect all the short levers which they used for hoisting their sails, and which at a distance would look not unlike firearms, particularly if the deception was assisted by the report of a double-barreled gun. Everything looked promising, and I thought my recruits were likely to be of some service to me, but when the nearest pirate, who had been coming fast down upon us, gave us a broadside, it was too much for my Chinamen. They were instantly panic-struck, threw down their arms, and ran below. And, added to this, I had again to threaten the men at the helm, who seemed half inclined to follow the example of the others, so I now prepared for the worst. The pirates came on, firing at intervals as the others had done, and I followed my former plan of watching their movements until they were nearly enough for my gun to tell upon them with fearful precision. Their shot was now flying about our ears and riddling our sails, and they came on in their usual noisy manner, perfectly unconscious of what I had in store for the reception. For the last time the helm of the nearest junk was put down, when we instantly fell flat on our faces and allowed the shot to pass over us. As soon as their last gun was fired, and before they had time to load again, I poured the contents of my gun amongst them fore and aft, raking the deck as I had done before. This took them completely by surprise, and as we were still under a heavy press of sail, we were soon a considerable way ahead of them. Two others of the fleet came up and fired some shots at us, but the whole of them evidently imagined that a number of foreigners were on board our junk, a belief which doubtless had a great deal to do with the success which attended my efforts. At length, darkness coming on, they gave up the pursuit and bore away from us, and in two hours more we arrived at a safe anchorage. The fever, which I had scarcely felt during all this excitement, now returned with greater violence, and I was heartily glad to go below and turn into my bed. During the night I heard a great noise on board, but was too feverish and weak to make any inquiries as to the cause. In the morning my servant informed me that it was occasioned by the arrival of three junks during the night, which had been chased to the entrance of the harbour by the pirates. There had, he said, originally been four in company, but one of them had been taken. The sailors on board these junks had not been so fortunate as we had been, for several of them were severely wounded, and I was now asked to extract the balls. The wounds were large and ragged, owing to the iron shot which the Chinese use in their guns. I advised the wounded men to hurry on to Chusan, where they would get good medical advice. Up to nine o'clock in the morning, although the wind and tide were both favorable, there were no signs of the junks getting under way. I therefore sent for the captain, and inquired if it was not his intention to proceed. He told me that he had had a meeting with the captains of the other vessels, and that they had determined to get a convoy of war junks from the Mandarin before they went on. Being now within eighty or ninety miles of Chusan, I could easily hire a small boat for that distance, and therefore said to the captain, Very well, then I shall leave you here, as I am very unwell, 
and anxious to get to Chusen as soon as possible. Go, said I, turning to my servant, and engage a boat to take me to Chusen, and bring it here as soon as you can. When he was about to leave the vessel, several of the crew gathered round him and attempted to persuade him not to go. Anxious to serve his countrymen, although at my expense, he loitered about for a little while, and then came back and informed me that it was no use going on shore, as I should not be able to engage a boat to take me so far. As I had been informed, by one of the shore people who had come on board, that plenty of boats were to be had on hire, I felt annoyed at his deceit, and threatened to punish him if he did not start immediately and bring a boat off. When he saw that I was determined, he turned sulkily away, jumped into a sandpan, and procured a boat without the slightest difficulty. The captain and crew now crowded round me, begging me not to leave them, and offering to get up their anchor and proceed at once. Although my destination was Chusen, I had taken my passage for Ningpo, as all the wood junks were bound either for that port or Chapu. On their now begging me to stay, I told them that unless they would sail into Chusan Harbour and leave me there as they passed, I would proceed in the small boat, as I was anxious to get there as soon as possible, in order to obtain medicine and advice. Oh, said they, if you will only go with us, we will run into Chusan Harbour and leave you there before we cross over to Ningpo. Upon this assurance I agreed to accompany them. The captains of the other junks now came to me and asked me if I would undertake to protect them all from the attacks of the pirates, as, if so, they would get under way and go with us also. Upon my telling them that I could not undertake to do this, they told me that they must wait until some arrangement could be made with the mandarins, as they were afraid to proceed alone. We therefore left them at anchor, and proceeded on our voyage. During the day we frequently saw suspicious-looking craft, which were pronounced by the crew to be jendos, but none of them were near enough to attack us. Late in the afternoon, as we approached Kido Point, a promontory of the mainland near Chusan, we met a large fleet of merchant junks sailing together for mutual protection on their way down. Some of them came alongside us and made anxious inquiries regarding the Jandus, and how many of them they might expect to meet with. Our people did not fail to give them an exaggerated account of the number we had seen and fought with, and the news did not appear greatly to delight them. During the night, the tide turned against us, and as the wind, although fair, was light, we were obliged to anchor until morning. When I went on deck at daylight the following morning, we found we were just under Quito Point, and only a few miles from Chusan Harbour. The land was well known to me, having been frequently there before. It was the most welcome sight which had met my eyes for many a long day, and I was thankful indeed to the Almighty for my escape from the pirates. Whilst the men were heaving up the anchor, my old friends the captain and pilot came below, bolder and in much better spirits than heretofore, and informed me with the greatest coolness that they had changed their minds about going into the harbour of Chusan, and that I must go over with them to Ningpo, from which I could easily return in a small boat from Chusan. I felt very much nettled at this conduct, which, considering that I had saved their junk from being taken by the pirates on two different occasions, was most ungrateful. I reproached them with this ingratitude, telling them that, as they were now safe from the Jandus, they imagined that they could do with me just as they pleased. But you never deceived yourselves more, added I. You may show as much ingratitude as you please, but I shall take care that you fulfill the promise you made me yesterday, and take me to the harbour of Chusan before you go over to Ningpo. Look here. You see this gun and these pistols. They are all loaded. You know what effects they produced upon the Jandus. Take care they are not turned against yourselves. Englishmen never allow promises which have been made to them to be broken with impunity. I know the way into Chusan Harbour as well as you do, and when the anchor is up I shall stand at the helm, and if the pilot attempts to steer for Ningpo, he must take the consequence. This threat had the desired effect, and the trembling varlets landed me safely at Chusan in the course of the forenoon. What with the fever and excitement of the last few days, I was in a most deplorable condition when I reached Chusan. But as the greater part of my collections were in the country near Shanghai, I was most anxious to ascertain in what state they were, and, finding an English vessel about to sail for the Yangtze Kayang, I immediately crawled on board, and, having a fair wind, we soon reached our destination. I was kindly received by my friend Mr. Mackenzie, and under the skillful treatment of Dr. Kirk, the fever gradually left me. Amongst the more important of the acquisitions which I made in the vicinity of Shanghai, I must not forget to mention a fine and large variety of peach, which comes into the markets there about the middle of August, and remains in perfection for about ten days. It is grown in the peach orchards, 
a few miles to the south of the city, and it is quite a usual thing to see peaches of this variety 11 inches in circumference and 12 ounces in weight. This is, probably, what some writers call the Peking peach, about which such exaggerated stories have been told. Trees of the Shanghai variety are now in the garden of the Horticultural Society of London. The whole of my plants from the districts of Fuchao Fu, Chusan, and Ningpo, being brought together at Shanghai, I got them packed, and on the 10th of October, left the north of China for Hong Kong and England. As I went down the river, I could not but look around me with pride and satisfaction, for in this part of the country I had found the finest plants in my collections. It is only the patient botanical collector, the object of whose unintermitted labor is the introduction of the more valuable trees and shrubs of other countries into his own, who can appreciate what I felt. When we arrived at Hong Kong, I divided my collections, and dispatched eight glazed cases of living plants for England. The duplicates of these and many others I reserved to take home under my own care. I then went up to Canton and took my passage for London on the ship John Cooper. Eighteen glazed cases, filled with the most beautiful plants of northern China, were placed upon the poop of the ship, and we sailed on the 22nd of December. After a long but favorable voyage, we anchored in the Thames on the 6th of May, 1846. The plants arrived in excellent order, and were immediately conveyed to the garden of the Horticultural Society at Chiswick. Already, many of those which I first imported have found their way to the principal gardens in Europe, and at the present time, October 20th, 1846, the Anemone japonica is in full bloom in the garden of the Society at Chiswick, as luxuriant and beautiful as it ever grew in the graves of the Chinese near the ramparts of Shanghai. End of chapter 21 End of Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China by Robert Fortune